that, in 2014, um, I turned on the news. I was living here in Chicago. I had moved here from Nigeria in 2001. And I realized, I, I heard the news that this armed men had stormed a school in Nigeria and they kidnapped 276 girls. It's been years and I'm still, I, I still cannot believe that happened. Yeah. I think I stopped sleeping that day. Most of my life, I have been thinking about different ways with which I can try to highlight the issues relating to women that I was seeing, that my body, my soul, my heart wasn't agreeing with, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to go about doing anything. So I just kind of went with the flow and I noticed it and I speak up about it where I can. But, but that event that happened with those men kidnapping those girls was what forced me to know that it was time for me to do something. So that was what happened specifically to motivate starting my community. Now, I have to tell you, go prior to that, I hadn't been a member of any group on Facebook that was mm. anything like that. So I had no reference point whatsoever. Mm. I just knew that I wanted to do something to amplify the voices of women. Whenever I turned on the radio and TV following that event, everyone wanted to talk about terrorism. Everyone wanted to talk about how that was responsible for what happened. But I had a completely different take on it. And it was something that I had been awakened mm. to since I was a child. And it was that we have a community here. We have a society here that had built structures. I'm talking cultural structures, um, the religious structures. I'm talking, I mean, serious and major structures that were designed to systemically essentially raise men and condition our men to think of women as being not worth that much. And the same structures with preparing women and conditioning women to be silent and not speak up. So we were getting trained to endure the whatever discomforts were thrown our way, whatever pains, whatever. So in the face of violence, we shut up. In the face of pain, we don't say anything. And that was what I needed to tackle because I felt that that was the foundational issues was to get women to speak up. Yep, absolutely. So how did you do that in the beginning? I mean, did you know before you started the Facebook group, you did that logical thought process, which was, you know what, we need to humanize ourselves. We need to voice that we are full human thinking beings. And I'll do that by creating a space for women to do that. Or was it more just like, I need to say something and took it to Facebook and it evolved from there? Oh, no, it, it, it was it, it was nothing like that. What our community became, it's not, you don't plan that. <laughs> you, you don't. <laughs> uh, my thought was to, quite frankly, find women who were like me and were, you know, losing sleep over these issues and were concerned that, Women that, that we weren't bonding, we weren't creating real, authentic relationships that were enduring. We were a pretentious bunch where we worried about things and we don't actually talk about it. Mm. You know, people were angry a lot, <laughs> but no one was really talking about the whys of things. So what my initial idea was, was to give, uh, you know, create a space where I could find women who were like me, who were as worried about the same thing. And then we could all come together and form some sort of a resource and maybe decide to do a podcast or, uh, you know, just figure out ways that we can amplify women's voices. Yeah. So find that the people was, first and then exactly, figure out what to do. Exactly. I just wanted to see if that was, any, if I was crazy and I was the only one who was, you know, worried, so worried about this that I was losing sleep over it. Uh, and that was what I started the community for. It was supposed to be a way for me to cast a wide, crazy net and see if there were other women like me. So um, how did you do that? I know the name is very specific. It's like, are you a female? Are you Nigerian? It's like females in Nigeria. If I see that, I know if I'm one of them. But how did you get those very first people? How did you meet the first strangers? Mm -hmm. Well, we, um, our group was female in Nigeria. It is now female in because we kept the acronym. Uh, it's now female in because we started getting so diverse so yeah. fast. And mm -hmm. lots of women were coming into the community saying that, I know this is female in Nigeria, but I have a story to tell and I've never found any space more comfortable for me to tell it. So we just decided to drop the geographic you know, limitations so that every woman who wanted a place would know that she was welcome here. 
Yeah, I want to ask you about that decision a little bit more in detail, just because this is something we see with so many communities of, do we keep that group tight so that it's really meaningful for that early group or do we grow? But tell me again, you know, how, so how, who are these very, very first women? And yeah, I, I'm just curious as to how they found you or you found them and just got the early momentum going. When I created the group, the first thing I knew that I needed to do was go find individuals that I already knew that, you know, they knew what they were doing because I, I had no idea what I was doing. Never created a group. I'd barely ever been in one. So I knew a woman that I'd met online who had issues with her group. And I, you know, she ran a community of more than 200,000 people at that time. And so I reached out to her and asked if she wanted to come on board to help me with my new group. And then I went to another woman who I knew to be a champion for women um, on several different issues and she spoke up a lot. So I invited both of them to assist me um, in whatever way they could. Now, I knew what the issues were and I wanted to talk about them, to highlight them. So I went throughout the internet to find information about those issues. I did a little bit of research. So what I did was I found snippets of quotes where women said the issue that I wanted to talk about, they talked about it in those quotes. So from Twitter to Facebook to blogs. Regular um, women or kind of regular women? women. Yeah. Regular women. Awesome. Regular women. So for instance, I'm going to give you a quick example. Like say a woman said, I wasn't even allowed to date until I was 24. And my parents wanted me to have a husband by the time I was 24 and a half. Like <laughs> in two weeks after dating, like you got it. Where is he? Like I'm not understanding when I was meeting his family. <laughs> <laughs> these were, these are, or, you know, oh, I would see a post where as a woman said, yesterday, I tried to go get an apartment because I just, you know, I'm a widow now and I lost my, my husband and we need a house to stay. But the landlord said, I'm sorry that we're not going to rent to a woman unless you bring a man with you. If you do not, you might be a prostitute or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So yeah. essentially women could not rent their own apartments. They can't. You, know, you have an expectation that if you do not come with a man, something you know is not right about you. So that was oh, what. So I was I just going to say, it sounds like your taste in what's interesting to a woman today, and in particular, a Nigerian woman, made a huge difference as to whether or not people wanted to be in the group. Like you pulled out because of your life experience, all of these things that you were like, yep, that person is talking about something I know is emblematic. Absolutely. But at that point, what my expectation was, was not to use it as a tool to drag people in at all. It was for me, I expected that when I highlighted those um, sentences and you know, those comments, and I quoted them and I put them on my group. What my expectation was, was the women who we had invited to the groups, which were just friends that we, you know, we knew online. I thought that they were just going to have a wide angle conversation about those issues, kind of like punditry and just say, well, like, that's terrible that this is still happening in today's age. Like, who's, who's going to do something about this? These things don't get talked about in the media and that, like, we don't discuss those things. Everyone is saying, you know, we're trying to highlight the big ideas, but what about the small stuff? They seem like small stuff, except they are issues that women have to deal with every single day while we're being systemically criminalized in our own lives. Yeah, while well, you're you trying know. to study and having to wash the dishes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There are little boys running around and no one is going to go ask them, you know? Yeah. So that was what my expectation was at that point. But boy, was I surprised quickly. That wasn't how it went at all. Mm. The way it went instead was the new members we'd added, they just started talking about what happened to them. They went personal, real personal, really quickly. Mm. Like they were just, oh my God, that happened to me yesterday. Oh my God, this happened to my sister. Yes, that captures what I'm saying. This is happening to me right now. I was just at the barber salon to cut my hair and the guy said, you can't cut your hair. You have to bring a note from your husband saying mm. it's okay to cut your hair. Mm. And just in a nuts and bolts way, did that mean that people would take a quote 
that you had posted on Facebook to a group and would they then just comment or would they share that quote? Like, how, you know, how did that live? Because obviously something about the internet that makes that different is it can get passed in some way, right? Right. It, it was, it was, they were interacting with it. They were just essentially making comments about it. And within those comments, they were talking about what their own experiences were. I realized that it's really a powerful thing. It was a big realization that because I didn't do a narration along with those quotes, I, I didn't frame the conversation. I didn't inject myself into that experience. And therefore, that helped to define for them how they should behave within that community. I had highlighted another woman's voice. And that woman, and I made clear on there that I was highlighting her voice because I had quotes around it. Mm -hmm. I have, my background is in broadcast journalism. So it is natural to me to like quote something that I didn't say. And so they were there and they, they just immediately felt it communicated to them a cue to tell their own experience as well. Absolutely. Who yeah. knew? Yeah, we, uh, it's funny. I think the main thing the community team did for Instagram was to tell stories about interesting ways other people were taking photos or to create suggested users that were doing interesting things with photos because we mimic each other. We mimic what we see. And that's it sounds like that's exactly what you did. You made role model, you kind of role modeled the behavior that people just picked up and copied. It's really unbelievable, I'm telling you, because right when that happened and everyone just kept started saying what had happened to them as their response or the, the way they interacted with the story of the individuals that I, I highlighted. In fact, I mean, I'm talking some of them were even one liners. They were one or two liners, very simple and very easy to, to digest. And these guys just immediately the stories that were coming out, their responses were so raw. It was so, I mean, they were juicier than the original thing that I had found on the internet. Plus, this was more of a safer space because it's an enclosed space. And so more people were just sharing and sharing. And they started, they just couldn't, I think the people were just surprised at just how deep folks were going, that they just went back to their profiles and added every woman they knew wow. to the community. Wow. And, uh, they just couldn't believe it because huh. you have to remember. Like you have to see this kind of thing. You have to, exactly. You have